All right, so segment trees are actually a pretty intuitive concept. Uh, it, it, it may be an advanced concept, but it's actually pretty intuitive in that you can like derive it uh, from first principles. And that's kind of what we're gonna do. And actually, uh, you know, just to kind of, uh, I, I don't know if this is actually convincing, but to convince you that uh, segment trees are intuitive, I'll say that like I actually never read this concept in a textbook at first. Uh, I actually, uh, invented this concept just to solve a problem at one point. I just faced a problem where I didn't know like what the required technique was, and I came up with the concept. Uh, and then, you know, for a while I called the concept summary trees because I saw it kept coming up in other problems. And I was calling this concept summary trees, just in my mind. Uh, and then I learned that this concept exists and it's called segment trees. And I was like, oh wow, okay. Uh, so, but, but really, it arises like very naturally. And you, you will like see kind of how it arises. Um, I, the, there's, I've actually done an exercise before where I've had a problem solving workshop where I just give you the problem that inspires this. And some people are actually able to like invent this concept. Like I'm not the only one, like uh, other people have been able to like come up with the concept too, uh, just based on kind of facing this problem. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, straight out like start with a problem. Uh, and then we can kind of brainstorm about it, and then we can come up with different solutions. And first, I think uh, I'm going to introduce some solutions to it that are like not the segment tree solution. So you can see what some other solutions can look like. And then finally, we'll eventually get to the segment tree, um, and we'll see what that does. And then we'll, after we've already come up with the segment tree in kind of the second part of the session, after we take a break, uh, you know, we will look at kind of some more involved problems. Uh, where, you know, you have to, you know, it's, it's not as simple as this, like, first scenario. So the problem I faced, and this is a problem I actually faced in an interview uh, at a pretty, like, elite company uh, back in the day, back in the day when they were asking such questions. Uh, I don't think they ask such questions anymore. Uh, so the question is, um, basically, it's called the spreadsheet problem. And uh, the idea is this. Well, uh, I'll introduce a somewhat different version of it first, and then eventually we will get to the part I was actually asked. So the spreadsheet problem is basically you have an Excel spreadsheet. So imagine like how like an Excel spreadsheet looks like, right? So you have, uh, you know, you basically have rows, right? Your rows are numbered like one, two, three, and they may be different sizes because the user may stretch and resize the rows, right? And then you have columns like A, B, C, whatever, right? And again, the columns can be different sizes. So now, imagine that like the number of columns and rows is fixed. Well, it, like this is just like a, an initial simplification, let's say. Uh, the number of rows and columns is fixed. Uh, so somewhere, internally, uh, you're storing some kind of data structure that is just saying like, what are the sizes of these, of these uh, rows and of these columns? Now, uh, every column is distributed the same way across all rows. Uh, so, so let's say, you know, somewhere internally you just have this array that's kind of like row, uh, whatever, row heights or whatever you want to call them. And this is storing basically like in pixels or whatever uh, how large each row is. Uh, and, you know, let's say like in this case it's like 10, 10, 10, 30 or whatever. So, you know, you have a structure like this. And you, have a, and you have like a similar structure for the columns. And now the problem you're basically asked is, let's say the viewer wants to view all the rows between, between uh, you know, some given row A, you know, some given row index I, and another given row index J. So they basically give you like two indices, I and J, and you have to say, like, basically, how big does the viewport have to be to be able to display all those rows? At the same time, uh, the user may actually resize the rows dynamically. So, for example, um, the user may issue navigations to a viewport, like, where, you know, you say, like, I, okay, I want index I and index J. Uh, how big does the viewport have to be so, so we can resize the window to that dimension? And at the same time, uh, the viewer may, uh, well, not at the same time, but like interleaved with those kinds of operations, the user may change the size of a row. So that, for example, the user can take this row and can make it 30 pixels instead, 
And then the next time you do one of these operations where you have to find the size of a viewport, you have to take that into account. You have to take that change into account. So conceptually, this is the same problem for rows and columns. Like you can solve the row and the column problem independently because they're kind of independent of each other. So we'll just focus on the problem of the rows. Uh, you know, because the column, uh, if you can figure out how big, you, you can figure out how big the, you know, y dimension should be versus how big the x dimension should be. You can figure that out independently. Uh, because every, every row has the same column structure. That's the assumption here. So let's just take the problem of rows. So the, the, the problem with the rows is that is, is just that the user can at any time resize a row, in which case its size gets updated in this data structure. Um, and your goal is basically just given an index i and an index j, say how many total pixels are in between. So, uh, you know, perhaps you don't understand why this is difficult yet, but okay, uh, the idea is that you have to do it more efficiently than the naive algorithm. Uh, so, what is the naive algorithm? The naive algorithm is you maintain everything in an array. When the user changes a row size, you just update it directly in the array. This is very efficient, order one. Uh, and then when you need to know uh, how many uh, pixels are in a particular given, you know, i and j range, you just make a loop through them, right? Like if, if this is i and this is j, we're just going to loop and we're going to sum them up. Okay. So let's put this as like a candidate algorithm. We're going to make kind of like a list of different algorithms over here. Uh, so let, I'll make this the algorithm column. And... Uh, here I will give uh, different analyses of the algorithms. So say, um, so there's basically going to be a query. This is like the time complexity of the query operation. The query operation is what is the size of the viewport between index i and index j. That's the query operation. Uh, then there's the update. How quickly can you update the data structure? And then there's like space. This is like how much, how much extra space beyond the basic array which you obviously must maintain anyway. Uh, beyond like the basic array that maintains all the sizes of the rows, how much extra space do you need? Okay, so, so like the naive algorithm is kind of the one I just outlined. You will maintain nothing other than the base array and you will just update directly in the array. So look at that, update is very efficient. Um, but query, the problem is that query is order n, where n is the number of elements in the array, right? Well, it's not order n, it's order r, where r is the size of the range. Does that make sense? Uh, like, like, if you have to find the sum of all elements between index i and index j, uh, it will take you linear time. Now, of course, uh, linear time is the minimum for this if you've never seen the array before. Like, if you are seeing an array for the first time and I ask you what is the sum of all elements between i and j, like, from like an information theoretic perspective, you can't know the answer unless you've looked at every entry between index i and index j, right? So, that actually means, like, this is the minimum complexity if you've never seen the array before. But in this problem, the idea is that you're allowed to pre-process the array. So, you're basically given the initial, you're given the initial uh, array sizes, you're allowed to pre-process the array, but then after this pre-processing, the user may still change, uh, the, the user may change rows one at a time, the user may change the rows one at a time, and they may also issue a number of queries kind of interspersed and interleaved with the updates. So for example, you, you may start with a situation where uh, you may start with all the rows having size 10. Like maybe you start with an array that looks like this, you know, you have five rows and they're all size 10. And then, the, and then you're asked, okay, for i equals one and j equals three, what's the answer? And you say, okay, it's 30. And then, uh, you know, one and three. Sum of all of these elements is 30. And, th and then the user says, okay, actually now I'm gonna update this entry to 15. So now their array becomes this. And then maybe the, maybe the user issues another query. And now you have to be able to say efficiently that this is 30, 45. Yeah, so, the, so in the case of the naive algorithm, you would just only just maintain like one copy of this array. You just maintain this array and that's all. Uh, you update just directly in the array anytime you need it. And you just sum naively with a for loop. 
Uh, and that's basically the algorithm you have to use if you've never seen the array before. But if you have seen the array before and you were just uh, making small updates to it, the idea is that you can do this much more efficiently. Okay, so um, first let's see kind of another idea before we even try to develop any of the intuition for segment trees. Let's just see kind of another idea. So let's say um, I want my query to be really efficient, but I don't really care about the update time. Like maybe I never update my array. Let's say I don't need updates. Let's say my array is just static. Like the user never resizes the, col the sizes of the rows. The user never resizes the rows. We just need to support this efficient IJ query. In that case, we will actually be able to give an algorithm that doesn't use segment trees or anything. It's just a very simple algorithm that does this. That actually allows us to query it in just constant time. So many of you probably already know what this algorithm is. But if not, this is the so-called cumulative array trick. Uh, so, so let's say your original rows array, I'll call it A, yeah, it looks like this. Let's say, you know, for example, let, let's say this is your array. You create another cumulative array, I'll call it C, and the cumulative array is basically just like the running total of all the elements so far. So you start with zero, and then you just sum in all of these elements. The cumulative array will be like one bigger than the original array. Uh, so, so now this is zero. Now this is eight. Then I add in another five. So I take this value and I add in the next value, 13. I take 13 and I add in the next value, 23, 43, 46. In a way, this is sort of like, you know, don't let this confuse you, but in case it actually makes any connections in your mind, I'll say this is kind of like a discrete integral of sorts. Like, essentially, this is like kind of the area under the curve. This is like the sum of all the contributions, right? Like, like here, we basically got like, you know, we started with zero, that's like the initial area. Then, then we add eight. Like, if you see, like in other words, if you were to like, uh, you know, see this as a histogram, like here you got eight, and here you got five, and here you got 10. Like this function here, this cumulative array is like the total area under the curve from this point forward at each place. You know, it's like cumulative, it's the cumulative sum. So it's, it's really kind of like an integral, but if you forget your calculus and that concept confuses you, then don't worry about it. You don't need to understand integrals here. This is just, this is just saying it's the cumulative sum of all the elements that came up to that point. Like basically B of I, or rather C of I, I call it C, C of I is the sum of basically A of I minus one all the way back to A of zero. So first those will be like zero and then eight, and then I will take this eight and add this five, get 13, I will take this 13 and add this 10. So clearly this is being computed in linear time. Uh, th this requires us to build, we will need to build this array explicitly, so we will need to store this in linear space. Um, th this will also require a linear amount of time for the initial pre-processing, like before we do any queries. But once we've completed that, once we've completed the pre-processing, uh, okay, so now we have this. Now we can compute the answer very efficiently. Why is that? Because um, let, let's say we have a query and we say, okay, we want i equals 1, and we want to go up to j equals 3. In this case, uh, in, in this case I assume it's kind of inclusive on both ends, right? So, so, so here's the thing. So i equals 1, if I look at c of 1, Bit eight, bit, this value of 8 is basically the sum of everything that came before the start of this window. So the idea is this, uh, like, I want to get the sum of this window, and I want to subtract the sum of this window. So to get, to get, to get this window, right, this is my goal, this is my like, goal right here, to get what's in here, I'm going to take the sum from the start of the array, which will cover all of this, and then I will subtract out this prefix that is not part of my array. So what is the sum of the prefix? Well, uh, you, you know, so, so if I had an index of i of 1, I just look at c of 1, and that's this, that's this 8. This 8 is the sum of this prefix. If, if for example, I was trying to get it here, uh, and i was 2, I would go to the second element here, and I would get 13, which would be the sum of these two. 
Um, and then I also need to know like what is the sum of uh, well, I, I basically need to ask what is the sum of this prefix. So that's this 43 right here. So the formula basically ends up being something like this. You know, you can work out the plus ones, minus ones, but uh, basically for like this case, uh, when you have j equals 3, this is c of 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so you get 43. 43 is, the, is this sum, 43 is this, this thing that we wanted. Um, and then c of i will subtract out c of 1, which will be this value, which will be subtracting out this. Uh, so this will be 43 minus 8. This will give us 35 in this case, and 35 is the sum of this segment. So you see how, how it's kind of like it's kind of like an integral. You like basically you know you have that like subtract out the contribution at b minus the contribution of a or whatever. So so here you know you have like some total cumulative contribution up to up to like the end of your range, and you subtract whatever came before your range started, and you get the answer. <coughs> So this is a really good technique. Uh, we'll call this cumulative sums. Cumulative sums. Uh, this is the best technique if you don't need updates. Uh, by the way, you know, always a risk of like learning new concepts, and you know, don't let this discourage you from learning new concepts. But always, you know, a risk you have to be cognizant of is that you know, if the new concept you're learning is complicated, you might overuse it by you know basically using it everywhere uh, rather than than using some simpler concept where a simpler concept would have sufficed right and this is one of those cases like beware that you really don't need segment trees unless you require the efficient update operation like if all you wanted to do was get this efficient query but your array never changes then you can just go for this idea so any questions on that so far like is the you know, basically, is the kind of problem motivation as well as the as well as the technique so far. Is that pretty clear? Any uh, questions up to this point? Okay. So either people are like hopelessly confused or people are following. I hope people are following. Yeah. Um. So those things are actually kind of like very similar. Yeah. So the question was like, what about binary index trees? Isn't this problem formulation a problem formulation for binary index trees? Well, binary index trees are like basically this very special case of segment trees. Uh, maybe if we get a chance, I don't know if we will discuss them today or not. But there's a kind of this related idea called binary index trees. Basically, it's just like an optimization of a segment tree. It's like for a special case of segment trees. Segment trees are actually more general. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, the, so, so so far like, this is the, well, this is what we have. Now what is kind of like the problem with uh, this is basically we have no way to provide both efficient query and efficient update. So if we have a situation where there's a lot of updates and a lot of queries, uh, we might potentially be kind of in trouble. Uh, like we have this which works well for a static data set and we have this which you know is just a naive solution. But we don't have anything that is like efficient both in update and in query. Uh, so would we have maintained like both of them at the same time? No. Oh, okay. Well, it's worth taking a look. Uh, but no. Because see, the problem is why can't like we make the cumulative approach efficient? Uh, the, the, the issue is this. Let's say one of your elements changes, right? Let's say you have an update. So, so like you have an update. This is your original array. This is your cumulative array. What happens if I need to change the first element? Like I need to change this to 10. Well, the problem is like I will have to update every value, right? In, in other words, the values are structured in such a way that basically every value in this cumulative array, or except the zero, I guess, but like every value in this cumulative array is actually dependent on this first value. So basically the best I can do here is like if I update a value towards the end, then maybe I only recompute the end. If I update a value in the middle, I have to recompute half the array. But I can't prevent the possibility that I might update a value at the beginning. Uh, so I you know, can't prevent the possibility I'll, have to re I'll just have to recompute the whole thing. So there's no like efficient way to maintain this data structure, right? This data structure is only useful if it's accurate. 
And it can't be accurate unless you like recompute the whole thing after an update. Now, this can still be useful if you have an update, if like updates are like very, very rare, or if they're done like together in big batches where like everything gets updated at once and then you recompute it, and then you just query it for a while, and then maybe every day you recompute it. Uh, like sure, uh, in those contexts, this could definitely be a sensible method. But what if like on the fly you're constantly changing it and you're also constantly uh, querying it? Can we store just a, uh, a two, you know, which means that we update it to after zero is location. So whatever is coming after that, we just add two after that. Or, or any update is happening at j i location, we can say that, you know, either is a plus two or a minus three or something, and then cumulatively take that thing and return the value in the end. Uh, uh, okay, I'm not sure I understand your idea, but uh, like, is it this? I, I, are you proposing that we just can maintain kind of like a set, like we maintain this data structure, right. and then additionally we maintain like a map of things that have changed, exactly. like maybe like a table of indices to right. like exactly. the change right. value. Each location, and then we can just cumulatively take those things into account. Well, the. So, so actually, um, you can kind of follow up on that idea to derive an algorithm that's like better than the running times we've stated so far. But the trouble is, like the th the issue you're going to run into is why, like, okay, what happens when your like set of changes gets large? Yes. That's right. Because 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 basically, then the running time, like right now, the running time is constant. But in your case, the running time will be like you will have to basically. You, you're basically proposing to carve out like a special map, a special record of exceptions. Right, and uh, eventually uh, after some time, we should go and merge those things and make the, the array back to it. Yeah, you have the right idea. This approach is actually workable and can result in a time complexity of square root of n. You like, I don't know, maybe I'll have a chance to show it later. But like, the, you know, the idea is you have to accumulate updates, but your running time will, be, will increase with the amount of things right. you haven't merged. Exactly. But if you merge too often, then you also run into problems, right? Because then it costs too much. So you have to kind of amortize the merges. And it gets kind of complicated, but you can actually use this to reduce query time to, you can reduce both query and update to, uh, well, actually, you can keep updated order one and reduce query time to, order square root amortized or something like that. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to cover that approach. I want to cover an approach that uh, kind of gets us closer to deriving the final concept of segment trees. By the way, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just say like what the complexity will be, you know, just to kind of, you know, uh, just as like a fun preview. So in, se in the segment tree version, in the end, when we get to the final idea, we will be able to solve both of these in both of these problems in logarithmic time. So very, you know, very nice kind of complexity, like really balances the update and the query like, pretty well. For like only a moderate, very moderate increase in the update time, we will get an enormous reduction in the query time. So you know, that will be very nice when we get to it, but first let's try a different idea. So, what a, like to me, kind of like the most obvious idea here. Like, let me extend this example maybe by a little bit. Uh, let's see. I think I want to give it nine elements. Okay. Let's try this. Okay. So to me, kind of the most obvious idea here, I don't know if it's like the most obvious idea to you, is just to put stuff into blocks, right? You have to have some kind of blocking approach here where like you uh, split the data into chunks and you maybe keep like information about the chunks separately. So, you know, why does that make sense? Because remember the whole problem with the cumulative approach was that every entry in the array depended on like a lot of, a lot of the entries in the original, right? Like every entry in the array actually had a dependency on the first element of the array. And that was a problem because then if you change it, you have to change everything. So what if instead it's kind of like much more localized, we just have blocks of entries, and for each block we accumulate a sum. And then when we have to sum over a wide range, we kind of use the blocks, we just kind of use like block level sums to quickly get the answer. So how would we do it? Well, basically the idea is we would pick a certain S 
S is block size. We would pick a certain parameter S that is the block size. And let, let's say here I pick S equals 3. Like, we don't know how to pick the optimal block size yet. We will see it later. So let's say I pick S equals 3. That, that basically means I need to build a blocks array that will be, you know, I will basically take the sum of each, uh, I'll, I'll use the word segment, of each segment of type of size 3. And I will store their sum in this blocks array. So 3 plus 8 plus 10, 21. Uh, 5 plus 10 plus 20, 35. And 3 plus 8 plus 6, uh, 17. Okay, so, so, now, so now this is the blocks array. Each block has a token. Like, like you can see it kind of like this. Uh, like each block is basically governing a part of the array. A segment of the array. We call it a segment because it's, a continu uh, it's like a contiguous chunk of the array. So, okay, so we have these blocks. Uh, so what, what can we do with them? Well, the idea is when we get a query, right? When we get a query, um, let's say we get a query that looks like, like so. Um, let's say we get i equals 1, so that's this one. And then we get, let's see, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, I don't know, for sake of argument, say we get j equals, uh, j equals 6, so that's this one. And it's, let's say it's inclusive on both ends. Let's, let's say it's inclusive on both ends. So we, we can see uh, that, that here's the situation. Some of the blocks are, like every block is, has one of three statuses essentially. Every block is either not covered by the query, it is partially covered by the query, or it is fully covered by the query. Like this block, we say it is fully covered by the query. And these blocks are partially covered with the, by the query. And if there were additional blocks outside of here, we would say they are not covered by the query. Now, here's the thing. Uh, how, what is the maximum number of blocks that can be partially covered by this query? Like for any query? Two. Two, right? Only the edge blocks can be partially covered. Every other block is either not covered, which means you don't need to worry about counting it at all, or it is fully covered, which means you can just look at its total in the, in the blocks array. OK, so now there's a very simple algorithm for how you can do this query. Here's the algorithm. Look at your two edge blocks. So basically, for i and j, we will compute their block number. It's very easy to compute the block number. You just divide through by the block size with truncating division. So for example, um, so, so basically, we will have a start block. So here's the start block. How do we calculate that? Uh, I is basically I divided by S. S is the block size. S is 3 here. The, the, the 3 is not a property of the query. The 3 is just a property of how we decided to pre-process the array. So S equals 3 and I equals 1. With truncating division, the start block is the 0th block. Uh, and likewise, we calculate the end block. And so for the end block, we take, uh, you know, we, take, we, we, we basically take uh, this value, j equals 6, uh, and divide by s, and we get 2. So now we know the start block is 0, and the end block is 2. OK, so now, now very simple algorithm. Basically, for, like, like first, you, first we'll do a loop summing over the blocks array. So basically, very simple, kind of like 4. Uh, you know, index from, from start block plus 1 to end block minus 1, go to that index in the block array and add it to a running sum. And then, so, so basically here, we, the, this will start at 1 and, and, you know, it'll end at 1, so we'll just get this block. Uh, this is the, because this is the only fully covered block by the query. So now we will have basically sum equals 35. This, is, this will be a running sum. And then we will visit all the two partially covered blocks. We will visit basically these two blocks, block number 0 and block number 2. We will look in the original array. 
And for the start block, we will loop from i to like the end of the block. We will loop over these two elements. And on the end block, we will just start from the start of the block and loop until the, uh, until the element j. So in total, here's basically kind of like what's covered. We loop over this block, this partially covered block, to get these two elements. Then we take this element from the blocks array because this block is totally covered. And then we loop you know, over the end block, or, or sorry, we don't get this eight element because that's outside of the bounds. We, we get just this element. <clears throat> so you see how it works. Uh, basically, every time a block is fully covered, you visit it only in the blocks array. You don't examine the individual elements. And when a block is partially covered, you will you know, iterate over the individual elements. Now, what's the running time of this? Pretty simple algorithm, right? What's the, what's the running time of this? So let's express the running time in terms of this parameter that is the block size. What do you think it is, the running time? O of s into some n divided by s. Yeah, that's right, that's right, that's right. How, so how did we get this? Um, so so uh, the block size, so, so uh, we have two partially covered blocks. In, e in each one of them, we may have to sum, in the worst case, s elements. Right? We have the start and end block, and in the start and end block, we sum the elements manually because the block may not be fully covered by the query. So we spend up to s, to s is the number of elements in this block, we spend up to s time here, we spend up to s time here, and then, so this is like s plus s, 2s, we drop the constant in the big O. And then additionally, we must spend time summing the blocks. How much time can we spend summing the blocks? Well, at a maximum, like if the query spans most of the array, it could be like all of the blocks. But how many blocks are there? Well, if, there, if a block size is s, then there are only n divided by s blocks. OK, so we got this equation. This is like the time. But now we should rightly ask, what is the correct size for a block? Uh, because we get to choose the block size. Like, not like in response to the query. We have to choose it in like a query independent way, because like the same preprocessed structure will have to serve all the queries, right? Uh, but we get to choose this ahead of time, and the decision can depend on n, on n. And in fact, you might see pretty clearly that the block size cannot be a constant, right? Because if the block size is a constant, you, you've reduced the constant factor, but you haven't improved the asymptotic running time. Because let's say uh, the block size is 10, right? Well, then this is 10. OK, that's small. But this is n over 10. And it's still order n. So even if the block size is a constant, I mean, OK, that could still be like a really useful reduction in a constant factor. But if you want to reduce the asymptotic time, running time, then the block size has to be some function of n. Now, what function of n do you think the block size should be? Square root of n, I guess. Yeah, it's actually square root of n. But, uh, but OK, let's, let's actually derive that. Like, how do we know that like, the answer is square root of n? Um, well, so basically, you have like kind of a minimization problem. right? You want to basically minimize this running time. You, you, you want to find the value of s that minimizes this running time uh, subject to reasonable constraints like s should be between like 1 and n or something. So how do you minimize an expression like this? Well, I'll give you two different methods. Uh, basically, one for people who know calculus and one for people who don't. Like, if you know calculus, it's very easy. Like, take the derivative, set it equal to 0, standard optimization technique in calculus. You have to take the derivative with respect to s because n is actually a constant. I mean, n is not a constant, but it's constant for the duration of the problem. Uh, basically, you get, as part of the problem statement, you get an array that has some size n. And then it's up to you to do what, what you will with it. But you don't control n. So you can't optimize for n. Uh, so you have to optimize with respect to s. So we have to take the derivative with respect to s. And taking that derivative, uh, we basically get uh, this. We get 1 minus n over s squared is going to equal 0. Uh, so um, you know, if you don't know how I got this equation, it's by taking this thing called the derivative of this expression. Um, you know, 
it's outside of the scope of this to kind of explain that, but basically you can just, don't, don't let that confuse you. Uh, if you don't know how I got this, just kind of treat it as a black box. There's like some optimization method that gives you this equation. Um, and then, you know, from here you basically end up with uh, n over s squared equals one, and this gives you s equals square root of n. Now, of course, the square the, the exact equality of square root of n here is not really precise because some constants were lost in here and here. Uh, so, you know, maybe the optimal size is actually like two square root of n, or maybe it's like four square root of n or something. Uh, but it's order square root of n. <clears throat> okay. So that's one way. Um, another way we can see it, uh, which is maybe not like as airtight, like this like calculus space method directly gives us a solution of square root of n. Um, but maybe one way you can see it is like, okay, clearly you, do, you don't want the block size to be constant, right? You can see why not. Because, well, first of all, from the mathematical expression, <clears throat> it's still order n like we said earlier, uh, if, if s is a constant. From just kind of like a logical perspective, if s is a constant, then basically what you're proposing is if you have this array, you're going to split it in small constant sized chunks, but then there's going to be like a lot of chunks, right? And then when you get a query that does something like this, you're going to have to iterate over a lot of chunks, right? That's why we don't want it to be constant. That's like the intuition. Uh, how about the other extreme? Like what if we make, uh, what if we make the block size so big that there's only a constant number of blocks in the array total? So like for some really large array, uh, you know, I'm only going to have like a couple of blocks. But these blocks themselves individually could be huge. Then the problem is that when I get a query, uh, it's true, I won't have to sum over very many blocks, that's good. But this running time could have like a ton of elements in it, right? Like there could be a ton of elements on each edge that I have to sum up, and this could be very slow. And so the idea is you have to balance it. So like on one hand, having, having s equal a constant is too small, and having s equal like some like fraction of n is too small. Having it be like, I don't know, n over 10, it, like that's too big. You know, we don't want the block size to be like n over 10, but we also don't want the block size to be like 10. We want it to be something in between. So square root of n kind of seems like it's in between, but uh, maybe we can characterize that better. Like let's say we, we say that the choice is gonna be n to some power c. C is like just like some power, like maybe it's 0.2 or 0.5, it's some fractional power between zero and one, because we want the answer to be between, like if, if C equals zero, then this is like a constant. Or there might be like some other like constant in front of this scaling it. But if C equals zero, then intuitively this is a constant. Like let's just say like S is gonna be like order of this, right? So. If c is like zero, then this is a constant. If c is one, then this is just order n. And we said that both of those are kind of too extreme. So we expect c to be something in the middle. So already like 0 0.5 comes to mind, which would be the square root. But let's make it more precise. Let's plug it into this expression. So here we get this. We get n to the cth power, that's s, plus n divided by n to the cth power. And rewriting this, we can rewrite it like so. So now we kind of see very clearly why square root is the best value. Yeah, you have n to the cth power plus n to the one minus cth power. So you see what the issue here is. If you pick c to be any greater than 0 0.5, then this part exceeds square root of n. But if you pick c to be any less than 0 0.5, then this part will exceed square root of n. Basically, either c or 1 minus c has to be bigger than 0 0.5, unless c is exactly 0 0.5, in which case they're both 0 0.5, and that, then that's the smallest you can get. You like, basically try to make s any smaller than the square root, and this part is bigger than the square root. Try to make s, like it's very intuitive now, right? Like you, you try to make this bigger, the, the, make this smaller than the square root. Because remember, in the big O, whichever one of these two parts is larger, it will dominate. <clears throat> so you try to make this less than the square root, then this part is bigger than the square root. You try to make this part l uh, less than the square root, then this part will be bigger. So uh, 
The only way you can have neither part be bigger is if they're all both equal to the square root, in which case this is the square root, and this is n over the square root, which is also the square root. And then square root plus square root is like two square roots, it's still order square root. Okay, so the optimal block size here is clearly, you know, choose the square root of the size of the array. <clears throat> so now we can add this to this chart. So this is the blocks approach. And here, uh, the query time uh, under the optimal block size, so we'll put square root in here, and then we'll get order square root of n query. Okay, update. Um, what is the update running time actually for this? Constant. Yeah, it's actually constant. Why constant? Well, uh, we have to be cautious. It's constant in the particular setting that I described with addition. How do you do the update here? Like, let's be clear on this. Like, what happens if we update this element? So first of all, we have to update it in the original array, right? And then we have to go to the block and update the block. Now, how do we update the block? Like, what we have to do is we have to note by how much we changed it, right? If we change 10 to 20, we say we're increasing the amount by a total of 10. And then we increase this amount by a total of 10. And then it works. Now if we run the same query again, it will pick up 8, 10, 45, and 3. And that will be the correct sum. So this seems to be constant. Now one thing I will note is that, so as we'll see later, the segment tree is actually kind of like more general than just addition. Like addition isn't the only thing it can do. Like right now our operator is addition. We're looking at sums of, the ra of ranges of queries. But the segment tree can do way more than just sums. It can actually do uh, a lot of different operations, like it could be mul doing multiplication, it could be doing products. Uh, like the operation you use here is actually kind of abstract. It actually can be any operation that's what's called associative. And I'll describe later like what that is if you don't know like what an associative operation is in math. But um, it can, the point is it can do more. It can do like matrices, it can do, it can do like matrix multiplication, it can do uh, regular multiplication, it can do sums, you, you can use it for max, like find the maximum of a range. Uh, there, like you can do a lot of like different operations with a segment tree. Um, so the thing is, uh, like I will note that this trick of updating it in constant time, it only worked for addition. Uh, and maybe a couple other operations it would work for. Like the ones that are basically, uh, <clears throat> kind of like what's called invertible, like you can kind of undo the operation. Uh, like for example, you can do addition, you can undo addition by doing subtraction. So like why is that? Like let's say instead our operation here was max, right? So let's say I, um, you know, let's say I have this scenario and so my block here for max would contain 20, right? Because the max of, the max of 5, 20, and 20 is 20. If I was doing this not with addition but with max, then the block would contain the value 20. But then let's say I change this value to 10. Now, how do I update the block? There's no way for me to update the block in constant time. I have to reprocess the whole block. So, uh, you know, because, because the operation max is not invertible. I can't just, I can't just like say thus, you know, the max of the block is gonna be 10 less because I changed one of the elements to be 10 less. I have to recompute the max of the block in that case. So it's only in the case of addition that we can update the block like efficiently because basically the way we do it in the case of addition is if I, if I took, you know, if I had 10 and I changed it to 20, I subtract 10 from the sum of my block and then I add 20 to the sum of my block. There's this element of subtraction where we kind of undo the effect of the previous operation. But in the case of something like max, you cannot undo the operation. So you have to recompute it from the block. Uh, so actually, this is only order one in the case where you have this like invertible operation. Otherwise, if it's an operation like max, which cannot be inverted, then you have to like reprocess the block, and still this will be efficient. Uh, you know, the block is only square root of n in size, and so you will reprocess it in square root of n. So this one is kind of like order one or square root of n, depending on you know order one or square root of n, depending on which situation you have. Uh, depending on whether you need to reprocess the whole block or you have like a shortcut. Uh, what is the space consumed by this data structure? It's actually pretty space efficient too, right? Because you only need like this one, uh, this one extra array. So it's actually square root of n. 
So this is nice. This doesn't even require a lot of extra space. All right. Yeah, just a, sim just a simple high. We'll keep like the order one here, but you know, it has the copy out that I mentioned. OK. So that's the block approach. So where next? Where can we go next with this? So uh, to kind of figure out how to improve further, uh, first, any questions about kind of like the block approach? So yep. In the block approach, how do we analyze uh, the initial computation with that score and write? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of not including initial pre-processing time. Obviously, any approach that attempts to pre-process the array will need at least order and pre-computation. Like, this is clear because uh, if you haven't spent at least order and pre-computation, you haven't viewed all the elements, in which case you can't possibly have, like, pre-computed something useful about every element. But if we consider that the algorithm is running on parallel process, then probably can be yeah, like let's not get into let's not get into parallelism right now. Though later I will show that actually it's very related. In fact, you may have multiple block sizes, like uh, uh, two or any whatever, and then do a like block thing. Yeah, I, I think you have the right idea. Uh, but but first, any uh, any questions specifically about uh, about like the current approach discussed, or is this like approach like pretty clear in terms of how it works? Pretty clear. Okay. Let's go on to the next uh, step. So, like, we're now now we're like almost ready to derive segment trees. Uh, but first, you know, one more thing, which is um, well, actually, two more things. Uh, so, first of all, you might wonder, uh, just out of kind of like curiosity, we don't have to go in depth to this, but you might wonder whether like a similar kind of relationship as there is here between these two approaches exists for the block approach as well. Like, in other words, can we perhaps um, like, like this is a pretty big, like relative to the cumulative sums approach, this is a pretty big regression in like this query time, right? And sure, we made update efficient again, but we lost quite a bit of query time. So you could imagine a scenario where maybe, maybe like clearly we need updates because if we didn't need updates, we would just use this approach. But maybe we need updates, but we really want to keep our query time like order one. But we want updates to be like more efficient than order n. So you might wonder, is there an approach that achieves this? Like, can we, again, push the running time into the update rather than the query and make queries order one again? And the answer is, yes, we can. Uh, because uh, we can actually add a cumulative array to all of these things. Uh, it gets kind of hairy, but sure, we can do it. Uh, so how would it work? Uh, well, what you have to do is basically, for the base array, we will define an array called like CA, cumulative of A. And for the base array, it's cumulative, but only on the individual level of each block. So we'll kind of like omit the leading zero because the leading zero could be kind of inferred in the cumulative array. And we'll write this kind of like so. So see, this is a cumulative array of just this block. And then here, when the new block picks up, we basically like start again. So, so every, every cumulative block is a function of just that block. And here we do like 3, 11, 17, like so. So this will be like our CA, cumulative of A. And then for B, we will also have a cumulative of B, which can have the, these values and so on. 66. This is cumulative of the block, you know. Um, so it gets kind of hairy, like I said. But we can do this. And how does this help? Well, now, if I want to, like, remember, every, every query is going to query a range of, in, in, in the base array, it's going to query some range in the starting block. It's going to query some range in the end block. And it's going to query some range of the blocks themselves. So I use the cumulative array of the blocks to get, in order one, any sum of the blocks. And I use these ones to get any sum of, of the core array. So then this, the, that, then there's basically three order one queries, and I complete this in order one. Um, and then how does the update work? Well, now the burden has kind of been shifted onto the update, but it will still run in the square root time, because now these cumulative blocks are still kind of localized to the block level. That's the core difference. So when we update, say, like this value, 
we'll only need to update here and here. We'll only need to update until the end of this block, which is limited in its size to square root of n. And then we will propagate the update over here, and then possibly we'll have to recompute the whole blocks array. But again, the blocks array is also limited to square root of n. So now we will kind of, we, at any time we can trade query performance for update performance, basically in all of these approaches. Now, it so turns out that in the segment, when you get down to the concept of the segment tree, you can't trade anymore because you've kind of already traded everything and you've made updates the same as queries, as we'll see. Uh, so but basically, by the time you get to segment tree, there's nothing more to trade. But in these kind of approaches, like block approaches or a naive approach, you can always trade one running time for the other. So, um, uh, how do we, oh, and by the way, like, uh, like this whole approach of like cumulative sums, like it only works for these invertible operations like addition and so on. If you have something like max, then you can't even use this approach. Like there's no way to use the cumulative sums approach, like whether like this one or this one or any of them for, uh, for a non-invertible operation such as max. Like think about how you would use this operation for max. It's not possible, right? Because uh, like how would you even use it? Well, like the cumulative sum version of the naive version. You, you, you can't do it because it's all about uh, like, you know, you, you, have, you have some range that looks like, that looks like this. And, and you say, okay, I want to get this range, and the way I want to do it is I want to compute this metric, and then I want to subtract out this piece. And there's no way you can do this if the operation is not invertible. Like, if what you have is like a max of all these values, and you have a max of all these values, there's no way you, the, 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 there's no way you can get the max of just the values in the middle by uh, using those two values. Thank you. Yeah, actually, of course. Max, you can compute max from the other side around. So in this case, you would be able, like, uh, for every block, you would compute max from the last element of the block uh, down to the first element. In this case, you would be able to find possibly the max of all that. But we need to, to have our two um, max arrays, one from the left to right and the right to left. Um. I don't think that really works. But even even if it does, like, it's not it's, it's not the same because. Well, uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so I, th I think I see what you're saying. Like for max, you could you could kind of like compute. Yeah, you could compute like a pre-stored array in this direction and a pre-stored array in this direction. Um, you still have to figure out how you're going to do it for the blocks, though, because the blocks could be some range that's in the middle and it's not at the end. Uh, and there's actually like no no good way to do that except by continuing with like a segment tree like approach or using one of the like. Uh, there's different ways to get like maximum of a range in an array, but uh, they're all basically kind of more complicated than what you're proposing. Uh, so, yeah, uh, okay, so I think we, we covered that part. Then the other thing I, wa I want to say is like, okay, so how do we make this better? Uh, like, well, let's go back to basics. Let's forget about these cumulative arrays. That's, that was always kind of ugly. I have one question. Uh huh. So, this might be not adjusted for the algorithm itself, but when we are implementing this, do we, because now we are having two structures that are kind of giving out, you know, that I'm relying upon for my operations. Uh -huh. So, like multiple. So, when I'm implementing it, like for multi threading, multi threaded applications where you have like things that are querying and updating, okay, uh, so you have to like worry about just making sure that it's in a consistent state for both readers and writers. I mean, the, the answer is like, yeah, like obviously you would have to worry about some things like that, but like let's, let's not worry about that now. Yeah. Uh, like later we'll discuss a little bit about how like uh, segment trees actually do relate to parallelism in some sense. Uh, but I, I don't really want to address the question as you've asked it right, right now because yeah, I mean, obviously, if there's like readers and writers at the same time, things can get kind of ugly. Uh huh. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, so, okay. Okay. So we gave this like block level approach. So to we have to try to understand how to improve, we have to figure out like what is still bad about the block approach. Uh, so why is it like still not like, I don't know, why can't we get like order one here, right? Why is it like order square root of n and all that? Well, the trouble is like no matter how, we've seen that no matter how you divide into blocks, you either end up with a lot of blocks or you end up with a lot of elements in each block. 
right? And even if you balance them, the best balance you can get is square root of n, which is kind of, kind of sort of still a large number of blocks and a large number of elements per block, but it kind of at least balances them out a little bit. Uh, so what if we saw, but, but like, let's look at the structure of the problem we end up with. Uh, so, so just consider the aspect of, you know, whatever blocks you have, you have to sum over all the blocks. Isn't that kind of coming back to the same problem? Like it is, right? Like we'll build some block structure here, and the blocks list here will be like small, right? But when I have to sum over some subrange of it, it's kind of back to the same problem. And the problem is that like even though the blocks the block structure is smaller than the original array, it's still kind of big. And that's why it's like square root of n. Or if you make it really small, then you have problems elsewhere. You have problems with just the sums that you have to do on the original array. So you can only condense so much with the blocks. So here's the idea. Add a block of blocks. Add another level of aggregation. So what if, uh, you know, this is just B1, right? Oh, okay, so, so how about this idea? Like, what if we have like this B1, like let's say this is our array, uh, just for simplicity, and let's say we decided on a block size of two. Uh, so this is 11, then this block is 15, then 40, and then 11. But now, uh, what if we create another level of aggregation, B2? And B2 has, again, a block size of 2, and summarizes these blocks like so. So this is a pretty neat idea, right? Like, like, like what if we have like, even more levels of aggregation to kind of accelerate the part here? Now, quick you know, kind of question. And okay, and you're gonna maybe already see that this is like actually kind of like a tree. Why is it kind of like a tree? Well, conceptually, we see that this element is the summary of this element and this element, right? And this element is a summary of this one and that one. And what is this element if not summarizing these elements, right? So essentially, this is kind of a tree. And if we wanted to, we could you know, add one more level of aggregation just to bring it down to a single element. Like some B3, right? OK. So before we go with the final kind of tree idea, like we see how this is like a hierarchy now. But let's ask, okay, what if we only like restricted ourselves to one more level of aggregation? So like now we have like we, the base array, we have an array of blocks, and we have an array of blocks of blocks, B2, right? We have this B1 and B2. What would be the ideal size? Like what block size should we use? Should it be different in each level maybe? Should it be uh, the same in each level? Like how can we argue for what the ideal block size is? Well, we should write the equation, right? Uh, so the running time, what is going to be the running time? Log n. Not yet, not yet. Uh, for like just three levels. Like so you have like the core array, you have the blocks, and you have the block of blocks. Uh, what would be the running time then? It's just kind of a curious thing to see. Uh, it's kind of a weird, weird running time. Like you've probably never seen such a weird running time, but like what is it? Uh, hmm? Uh, like the running time for like the query operation, let's say, or the well, yeah, let's say the query yeah, operation. Are the block sizes the same? Like the up to you, up to you. Like, how do you choose what if block size? If it's the same, then it's like assume s. Then I think it'll be something like s plus n by s and n by s square, something like that. Yeah, that kind of seems right. So, like, okay, so let, let's say you have a block size of um, like s one and s two. Yeah, but, like let's pick like s one and s two for the block sizes, right? Then uh, how much total work has to be done for the query? Well, at the top level of the array, the there S1. may be up to two blocks, right? There may be of up S1. to two blocks. Uh, yeah, exactly. There may be two blocks of size up to S1 that are, that are partially covered, so you have to visit them in the original array. Plus n divided by yes. S1. Then here there may be blocks that are partially covered, that are partially covered too in the next level of summary, so you have to visit them in this array. So uh, then, then that is up to S2. And then finally, you have to sum over some number of blocks in this array. 
And how many blocks is that? Well, at this point, the size of the array has been reduced from n to n over s1 to n over s1 s2. Right? Th does that make sense? Yeah. So, so basically, if you had um, uh, if, if you, you have an aggregation by a factor of s1 here, and you have an aggregation by a factor of s2 here, by the time you get down to the final array, this is the size. And this is the number of like elements that are partially covered in the first array, so you have to visit them in the base array. And then in the, in the second array, there are some elements that are partially covered too that are not uh, fully covered by the aggregation in the next array, right? So you have to you, you have to write an equation like this. And what is like the best solution here? Well, look at it this way, right? Uh, let, let's say S1 is any lower than the cube root of n, right? Cube root. How about, and this one is, then if we want the overall running time to be less than the cube root, then this one better also be less than the cube root. But then this one is greater than the cube root. So again, to balance them all, you have to set it to the cube root. S1 equals S2 equals cube root, cube root, and then this one will also be cube root. So with three levels of aggregation, we get like the third root. Uh, okay, so now uh, D, like we'll call this approach the D level, like the, let's say D is a dimension, D level blocks. So there are D levels of blocks. D is a, like a parameter, right? And we can give the running time in, with respect to this parameter. It's probably the weirdest running time you have ever seen, but uh, it is actually, so is it actually the dth root of n? It's actually not, it's actually d times, you have to be careful here, it is actually d times the dth root of n. Why is it d times? Because you have to also consider that... Um, that many constants, right? S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Exactly, like this running time, like, one, like when you set this to... to uh, say like the cube root, right? You get a cube root here, cube root here, cube root root here, but if you had more dimensions, you would get more of those cube roots. Uh, now, it doesn't matter for a concept like three. For a con like if this is three, then you just get three times the third root of n, which is still the third root of n. But if d can be a parameter, then you have to consider it. So weird running time, right? And then the update would actually be order d. Why order D? Because if you update something, it has to go through all the levels. It just has to propagate through all the levels. Um, similar to the same caveat as before, like if you can't just... Not, oh, so that's because you're doing the same all for one, right? This is for yeah. max. This is for max. If you're not for max, but this is for addition. Yeah, yeah, for addition. For, for max, it would be a little... It would be the same as here. Because you have to recompute every block. Recompute, which is this. Yeah. yeah, same caveat. Uh, and what is like the space analysis of this? Well, that's, this gets really hairy, so let's just skip it. But the point is that the, 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 basically the space is dominated by the first blocks array. So for example, um, in the case of uh, three levels of aggregation, the first array, like because S1 is the cube root of n, that means the number of entries in this array is actually like n to the two thirds power, and that would actually dominate it then. So it would be like something complicated like, uh, I mean, technically the running time if you're curious about it, don't let it confuse you too much, but like, it's like one over, yeah, it's like, it's like n to the power of one minus one over d. It's like really, you know, hairy, but you know, you can, not, not the important thing right now, like it's less than order n is like really the kind of takeaway point. You can do it, like any algorithm that only requires like order n space is usually considered pretty reasonable. Uh, and so, you know, this is like a pretty good running time. I mean, pretty good like space complexity. Definitely bounded by order of n. Um, and the, the running time is like this weird complexity, probably one of the weirdest complexities you've seen before. It, uh, but if you have d levels, then it's going to be d times d to the n. So then uh, an interesting question is like, what is this in the limit? Like, what is the best value of d? You see, you see how I'm driving this. Like before we asked what is the best size of the blocks, now we have like a parameterized solution that's like, okay, you can do for two block, for two levels of blocks, you can do for three levels, you can do for 10 levels of blocks. Uh, you can have as many levels of aggregation as you want. What is the best number of levels of aggregation? Okay, well, let's take a look. Um, so, 
I yeah. want to ask you about the number of elements and those, those in the previous, in the Yes. And S1 is like the block size of the first level and block size of the next level. Oh, in that particular example, yes. But it can be any, anything. Like the block size would normally, like I said, the block size is normally the, like for example, for three dimensions, you would make it the cube root of n. That would be like the correct thing to do. So this is just kind of extending the block approach. We saw how like square root of n was the best. But for like, if you have d levels of aggregation, the best factor, the best block size is the dth root of n, it so happens, and then you get this time complexity based on just considering the work that you have to do. Okay, and now finally, what is the best number of levels? Well, if you, if you have that, uh, well, first of all, here, consider this. If you take the log nth root of n, I mean, assuming this is like log base two, then this is two. Why, why is that? It's because like two to the log two nth power, by definition of logarithms, right? This is n. So taking the uh, log nth root of both sides, uh, you see that the log nth root of n is, the, is a constant. So here's the thing, if we take a log nth root here, right, uh, if we say d equals log n, so we want our aggregation to have logarithmically many levels, we get logarithm here, and we get a constant here. So this is a logarithm times a constant, so this is order log n. And then what do we get here? d, d is now a, a, a logarithm, so log n. And this is the segment tree. So this is just, uh, the segment tree is just a limiting case of, of these like block level aggregations. So, and, and you can't reduce it, be, you can't reduce it any more than this, right? Because you see that if you try to increase the beyond log n, then just this factor by itself will be more. Okay, so this, we, yes, we know that the segment tree is basically the limit of this block level approach to have as many levels of aggregation as possible. But now that we know this, we can actually massively simplify the idea because thinking of it as like the, all these levels of aggregation is really complicated. So now we can like really simplify the idea. So uh, now we, we're gonna make the idea really simple. Uh, because, question, what is the block size in this limiting case? Well, the block size was this dth root of n which for d equals log n is two. Okay, so here's the kind of the central idea of the segment tree. Take the original array, take the array A, and you know, just for fun, I'm gonna write it bottom to top and see why. Uh, so let's say you have some elements here. Okay. Okay, so here's the original array. So basically, we will build an aggregation here, call it, uh, you know, call it, I don't know, um, you know, if you call this like a zero, then you can call this a one. And we want the block size to be two. So take every two elements and elevate them to the next level as a sum. So three and five sum to eight. 6 and 9 sum to 15. 4 and 3 sum to 7. And 5 and 10 sum to 15. Okay, uh, and, then, and, the, and then make another level where, again, you always want the block size to be 2. I'm just drawing, like these can be, these can just be arrays. I'm just drawing the tree nodes to kind of help you see how this is a tree. And then once you get down to a single element, there's nothing else to summarize. And then you're done. So in a way, it was kind of never possible to really have more levels of aggregation than log n. Log n was just a logical limit. Because how could you have more? I mean, I, like, to, to have more levels than that, you would have to not aggregate at least two elements in every stage, in which case you're not really aggregating anything. Uh, so this is just the logical limit of this, you know, whole idea of block approaches. 
So hopefully you can kind of see how like this whole block approach can evolve into this idea of the segment tree. You could have maybe come up with a segment tree directly without thinking of that. But I do think like the basic block approach, not like the many levels, but like the one level is very like intuitive. And you, you can see that the segment tree is just a limiting case of that. So this is the segment tree data structure. Now, before we take a little break, let's just kind of see how it works. And then after the break, we will see more complicated problems using the concept. So actually, in terms of how it works, it ends up being pretty simple once you've constructed this tree. Now, how do you actually do this in memory? Well, you can do like different ways, right? So oftentimes, people will allocate a single array, and then they'll like kind of pre-store some offsets so they can have access to these like these like internal arrays. So you could you could kind of do it. I mean, how much space does the segment tree take up? It's actually very predictable if you think about it, right? Because this is n, this is like n over two, this is n over four, this is n over eight, and so on, right? This is a descending geometric series. So this actually comes to like two n. So you could just go ahead and allocate like two n space to your segment tree. And right, the original space is not counted. Oh yeah, I meant like in addition. Like if you want to store like it all in like the same data structure, you could, you know, you could, uh, you you could uh, allocate n space for your original elements and n for all your summary elements. You know, this first level will take n over two, then n over four, then n over eight, and so on. So the segment tree, fortunately, still doesn't require more than linear space. Uh, so we finally got here, and this is like our golden idea. Okay, and so you could allocate it all in the same structure. It might be kind of more convenient for you though, uh, you know, I mean, if you're not like micro-optimizing efficiency, it might be more convenient to just allocate it as separate arrays. Like the, the, the pointer math might be, might be easier than like the math of the array indices, because I'm about to show you like how simple the logic can actually be uh, for doing a query on this structure. So let's say we allocated these as separate arrays. So we basically have like an array of arrays. Uh, we, you know, like there's some kind of ultra array that is holding you know, these individual arrays. Um, and now let's say I get a query. So let's see how I would satisfy the query. So let's say I get um, i equals, for sake of argument, let's say I get i equals one. That means the range starts at this element and I want the sum starting like this range. And then I get, um, let's say I get i equal, or j, j is the end of my range, j equals seven. Uh, and that would be like this element. So I basically want the sum of like most of this, but excluding this element. So I want like this range. This is just an example. You can do any, any, any one. Okay, so how do we do this? Well. Um, basically, we have to kind of say whether, whether in the current array, this first element that we face, is it like fully covered? Uh, or rather, is it, um, or rather, is the query partially covering the next level of aggregation? In other words, like, is this element kind of in an odd position? Like, if we started, if the range had started at this three, I wouldn't want to count anything in this array because I would want to just promote to the next level. Basically, we try to promote the query to the next level as aggressively as possible. We kind of start with the, with the leads, and we try to promote the query to the next level as aggressively as possible. If both, if the next two elements that we would be taking are in the next level, then we would just promote to the next level. But here, see this five, we can't promote to the next level here, because this eight includes a value that's outside the range. And how do we detect this? We can actually, we, we know that this is summarized every two elements. So actually just by the fact that this offset is odd, like just by the fact that like i modulo two is, is one instead of zero, we can tell that this should be added by itself. So in that case, what we do is we, we, uh, we have this like running sum here. We have, we have a sum, uh, where should I put it? Yeah, so we have a running sum, and currently our sum is zero. This is the sum we started out with. Um, and 
So I will take this element and I will add it to the sum. So, so far I have a sum of five. And then I, what I will do is I will basically advance this index. I will say, okay, now i equals two. And now that I, you know, because now the remaining range I have to sum is just this range, right? Because I already added this to the sum. Now, the next thing I have to do is I have to, you know, I have to do this on the other end too. But on the other end, uh, I mean, the logic here, well, it probably helps if, if you make it exclusive, then you can kind of use the same logic. So here we'll just make like j equals eight. And j equals eight will just mean, like, we will not include the eighth element. Uh, it's easier this way. Um, and, and then we, I can say, because this is even, it, it, it means that this last element actually lies on a boundary, so it can be promoted to the next level. If instead j was like, if, if instead it was odd, like if instead we were like here, I would have to take this element, add it to the sum, and then shrink the range to just this. But okay, uh, so this didn't happen here. Okay, so now I'm ready to promote to the next level. So see, I took at most two elements. In this case, I took just one, but I could have taken one here too. I looked at at most two elements. I did some like constant time arithmetic, and now I'm ready to promote to the next level. So how do I promote? I just cut all the indices in two because there's there's a two for one relationship. So now uh, I want to now uh, look at the next level, and I was I, I was two down here. So now i equals one, and that's this one. And here i was eight. So now i or j was eight. So now j equals four. So that points past the end of this. It's basically non-inclusive. So, so now we have basically this range at the next level. We took this range and we shrunk it to this range. Okay, so now we do the same logic. Is i odd? Yes, it is. So i is odd, so that means we can't take this 23. We can't, before we move on to the next level, we have to shrink the range and get rid of this 15. Okay, so that means we are gonna add this 15 to the sum. And now, we kind of, again, shrink this range. And now we get i equals 2. And j is still 4. Uh, now, now they're both even. So OK, so now we're ready to promote to the next level. So uh, now i equals 1. Again, shrink by 2. And j equals 2. OK, so, so now, again, i is odd. Uh, that means we, t we take this 22 and we add it, so 42, and now we have the range i equals 2 to j equals 2, and we have a check for this condition. Once the range is empty, we stop. Okay, and so now the total sum is 42. And so see how it happens. We take at most, we take any odd elements that are hanging on the ends here, we get rid of them, we add them to the sum, and then we promote to the next level. So uh, to kind of uh, summarize it again, uh, what, ha what happened here was that essentially we started, by, we, we started by taking this element and we added it to the sum, right? That's what we did. We took this element and added it to the sum because it was kind of an odd positioned element here. Then we were, and, then, and here we didn't do the same thing because the element was aligned with the boundary. And, and then we promoted the query, and we were looking at this range. Then here again, we took this element and added it to the sum, and we now promoted the, and now the query was limited to this range, and now because this is aligned on a boundary, we promoted it over here. And here again, we took this element, and then at that point, we were done with the query. So, so see what's happening. In each level, we will take at most two, like maybe some starting element and some ending element, and then we will promote to the next level. And in each level, we will look at and take at most two elements. So it's basically constant time per level and logarithmic time total, because there's logarithmically many levels. And yeah, and the implementation of this is like pretty simple, because you know, you just check if like a boundary is even or odd, you increment the boundary if so, and you, uh, you know, if the boundary is odd, then you add it to the running total, and you, and you increment the boundary, then you divide everything through by two, 
promote to the next level and keep going until you've run out of ranges. So instead of going back, what down can't we go to like from top down to top down? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. So can you do can you do a top down? Uh, sure you can. Yeah, you could uh, like like basically if you know your the size of your array, like you know your array is size eight, you know that basically this left subtree has indices zero through three. If you want to make it easier on yourself, you could actually like store the indices within yeah, the index right, too. Uh, but you know that's it. That's usually better if you actually have nodes. I mean, you could just be implementing this as arrays too. It's maybe more space efficient then. You technically kind of don't need the indices because you can infer it. Uh, so let's say you know your array is a size eight, then you know that the left subtree must contain indices like zero or three. Um, and, and yeah, then you can do a top down too. One of the advantages of the bottom of the bottom approach is actually the running time of this is a little bit better uh, if you start from the bottom, if your range is small. And the reason is because you can actually you can actually see that if your range is small, you never have to go to the top of the tree. So actually, the running time will be log r. Because you, your range gets cut in half every time you advance a level. So you can prove that if your original range, range is like j minus i, like the span of elements that were had to be covered. If we let that, if we let r equals j minus i, that's like the range, then you can actually see that with the bottom up approach, the running time is bounded by log r. Whereas if you start at the top, because you, you can't guarantee that you won't have to go to one of the leaves, your running time will always be log n. You know, people ask me if I could explain the top-down approach a little better. Well, okay, I'll, I'll uh, try to do it quickly. Uh, so, basically, the idea is you get uh, you get a query, and let's say your um, query is something like I don't know, i equals two. So you know, the indices that th th these are the indices here: three, four, five, six, seven. Let's say you get a query like i equals two, j equals seven. So the th the thing is, basically, you go to the top node. And like every node, like we said, is going to have one of three classifications. Like either it's not covered, partially covered, or fully covered. So for the top node, it's almost always going to be partially covered. Because, you know, unless it's the full range or it's nothing, then it's partially covered. Okay, and now we basically recurse onto uh, Yeah, better to enter from the back of the room. Uh, now we recur, uh, n n now we uh, do the recurrence from, uh, well, well we, we try to recursively call the left node and the right node. Um, and to kind of see the efficiency of this method, we have to see that we, we don't end up doing like too much recursion. We don't have too many cases where uh, we have to kind of recursively call both the left branch and the right branch. So here's the thing, like when you have like the top level query, there is basically two cases. One case is that the query is going to be contained entirely in one of the subranges, right? Like the query goes only to the right or only to the left. Like, so, so basically, if, for example, I don't know, i equals 5 and j equals 7, then this node is partially covered, but this node is like not covered at all. And so this one is just skipped. So basically, the two cases are either one of the nodes is not covered and the other one is partially covered, or I suppose it could be fully covered. You could get lucky, and this could be like, this could be like i equals 4, j equals 7. So this one could be skipped, and this one could have its value taken right away. Uh, but uh, in, in general, uh, one of the node, either one of the nodes will be not covered, and the other node will be partially covered, like if the entire query is on that side. Or alternatively, the other thing that could happen is the query could be split between the two sides. But if the query is split between the two, the two sides, then what ends up happening is, see, here you will basically try to satisfy i equals 2 to j equals 3. And here you will try to satisfy uh, j equals 4, or sorry, i equals 4 to j equals 7. Like you will split the query into the two pe one piece for this side and one piece for this side. You know, this one's responsible for indices four to seven, and this one's responsible for indices zero to three, so you split the query of two to seven, to like two to three, and four to seven. Uh, but now, the key is that after this happens, yes, it's true that now we have to like recursively evaluate both of these nodes, but this situation can never happen again. 
that we would have to evaluate two nodes instead of just instead of just one in the next level of recursion because now these are edge aligned and what I mean by edge is like these are aligned to this middle boundary. This range of two to three is basically a, a suffix of this whole range and this range of four to seven or whatever other value you could have here is some prefix of this range. And now that they are kind of like aligned with the edge of the boundary, uh, this case of uh, having, to, having to do two recursions in one branch can never happen again. Because le le let's see like what can happen in this node. Like let's, say the recur like let's say we have a situation where this node is partially covered, right? And we also know that, it's, that the end of the range is aligned with this like end of this boundary that's controlled by this node. For example, we, you know, we might have i equals 2, j equals 3, or we might have i equals 0, j equals 3. Like these are all kind of aligned with the end of this boundary. Uh, but, but now we can see one thing clearly. So we basically have two kind of scenarios here. Like if we know that, you know, like we know that this node, it covers like this range from 0 to 3. Uh, there, there can be two cases. Either our query covers this entire node and then part of this one, in which, case, in which case this one is fully covered and this one is partially covered, or it could be that this query doesn't cover anything here and covers part of this one. For example, in the, in the, in the case where i equals 3, j equals 3, uh, this one will be not covered because you know, the query is outside of this range, and j equals 3, uh, and, and this node, the, the one that controls indices 2 and 3, will be partially covered, or fully covered if i is 2. But either way, you won't have to do the recursion here, you will just recurse on just this one branch at most, or it will be fully covered and you will immediately stop. Um, but if, for example, i equals 0 and j equals 3, or i equals 1, let's say, and j equals 3, uh, then what will happen is this one will be fully covered, so again you won't have to recurse into it. You will, just, you will just immediately get the sum that's at this node, and you will recurse only into the partially covered branch. So basically whenever you have a node that is partially, you start out with a node that is partially covered. Usually the root will always be partially covered by the query. Um, and every time, you start out with a node that is like partially covered, um, and basically the idea is that every partially covered node uh, only results in one of the branches of recursion being taken because the other one will either be not covered or will be fully covered. Uh, so that, that's kind of the analysis of the top-down approach. The only time that a partially covered query can result in two partially covered branches is the first time that that happens. Because, because like here, if you know, we have something, for example, for i equals 2, j equals 7, we have something that's legitimately spanning you know, both the left side and the right side. So the first time, we will split it into a, you know, some recursion on the left side and some recursion on the right side. But after that, they will be aligned to an edge, and this case will never happen again. So there, there's the kind of that factor of two again. Remember how in the bottom-up approach we had like two elements per level? Well, this is like the equivalent of two in the top-down approach. The top-down equivalent is that when you recurse, there may come one time where you actually split the recursion into two parts. But after that, ev you know, every recursive branch just calls one, one of the branches. And so you get like two log n once again. Anyway, uh, this is not the most important thing to understand right now, but I thought I would cover it uh, in case you were interested in how that analysis works out.